morning. Please join me in the opening prayer. Praise the Lord, who has shown us the wonders of his unfailing love. In you, O oh Lord, we put our trust. You are our God, and our lives are in your hands. Lord, let the light of your face shine on us as we celebrate together in your presence. Amen. All right, kiddos, coming up. I got stuff for you to do. <coughs> See how I did that? See? 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 Yeah. See? So He's giving me the eyebrow. So basically, what am I doing above the footpage? See this? Yeah. Like that. Hmm? How come you're not filming in the thing? What are you doing? Hello. Ready? Go. It's right there. <clears throat> help your, let your brother help you. Remember, only just a little bit high. No, not yet. Just draw a heart. You got a heart? Let me see how big your heart is. Oh, good. Got a heart? Nice. Awesome. Now, <clears throat> I want you to know that God sent his only son for you and for me so that those who believe can have eternal life, right? So God sent love in human form and God form himself, right? And so then when Jesus left the earth, he said that I'm going to send, my father's going to send you a helper, and that's the Holy Spirit. So God's love, when we believe in Jesus, gets into our heart. So let's say this represents God's love. Okay? So color in your heart. Color in your heart. Do you want pink instead? Red. It doesn't matter. Red, pink. Okay. What happened? That's all right. We can wash it. Okay, so fill in your heart. You see how I'm doing that? You want help? Fill it in. So much for your sister helping you. <laughs> Together. Ooh, look at you. Okay, so now our heart is filled with God's love. Everybody got a heart filled with God's love? Very good. Yep, everybody's drawing on the best ones. Okay, dry clean bill is coming. So now... We're going to, see this heart? It's full of love. Does God want us just to keep our love inside? Just know that we love God? Or does he want us to share it with people? Share it with people? So now what I need you to do is do three little hearts right on top of that big heart. Three little hearts. One, don't color them in. Two, with a pen. I don't know where your pen went. There you go. It's a system. It's a process. Okay. All right, you done? Yeah. All right, now bring me your pens and all your junk over here. Okay. Thank you. Wait, was I supposed to? Oh, I wasn't supposed to draw like that. I, no, that's good. That'll work too. Okay, so I want to read for you. So here we are. These are our hearts. These are our hearts with no. Don't fill them in. These are our hearts with God's love in it through the power of the Spirit, and God wants us to share it. So I want to read from you, to you a scripture found in the book of Romans written by Old or New Testament. If you get any ideas, this is old. If I split it, if I'm right there, I'm probably in the new. Very good. Okay, this is from the Apostle Paul. He writes this. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So there's the Holy Spirit. God's love in our hearts, right? And so God wants us to share the love by doing things that are nice and kind that Jesus would have done. So when we share it, let's say that this is, these are the nice things that we're going to do with God's love. It's going to be in our heart. 
we're gonna maybe sit by somebody for, go ahead and put it in there. You guys can put it in there, just the end. Yeah. Whoa, look at mine. Oh, oh my gosh, you got it already. Oh, well don't smash it down there. You want it to, hold on, let me put a little more water in. Look, I can't even get my hands There's no space? All right, well let me get mine out. Oh, I should have said put it in there. Yep, go ahead and dip. Dip yours right in front of it. Yep, just put it in there. Everybody dip and just hold it in there. Don't dip it too far. All right, so is it coming up into the little baby hearts? Yeah. Is it spreading into the baby hearts? Not really. Well, yeah, it's because you're making it take a bath. Don't worry about getting on the table. Don't you worry. Let me see. Oh, there's finally, my love is finally spreading. Holy smokes, that took forever. I must be stingy with my love. Did yours spread a lot? So, why does that cold? It's supposed to be hot. So anyway, this probably because we have cold water in there. So we get the love of God in us. Yours is it's great. Well, spread some love, will you? Okay, nice. Just be All right, show the congregation your spread love. All right, I think we need a round of applause for that. Okay. All right, so let's, what I want you guys to know is that when we share God's love that's in our hearts, we share God's love that's in our hearts, it can spread to other people. So when you do something kind, that's the love of God in your heart. When you do something kind, yours wasn't spreading, I bet you it is now. So God wants us to spread the love. He doesn't want us to keep it in our hearts and be stingy and mean. He wants us to be nice and kind, right? So we can pray for others and we can, we can share our snacks. God. You're not allowed to share snacks no. at school. Whatever. Somebody might be allergic. I get it. I don't know. But anyway, you can be nice, right? Are you nice? Yeah. Even to people that don't know God? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Hmm. We're going to talk about that today. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for each one here, each one of these little ones. And we thank you that when we come to faith to know you in our hearts, Lord, you give us your love. It stays right in there through the power of the Spirit. But you want us to share it. So thank you, Lord, for when we have an opportunity to open a door for someone, pray for someone, or just by some, sit by someone at lunch that's lonely, Lord. It's all your love being spread. In the name of Christ, amen. All right, so I've got fruit juice, or I've got down at the bottom jelly beans. Or what would you like? And then you guys are going down with Miss Donna. You want a jelly bean? Here. You want a jelly bean? It's right here in front of your face. Some of us ladies were out till what midnight on Friday, just wedding. so you know. And some of us had a wedding rehearsal, and then some of us have a wedding. Not that I'm making you feel sorry for me, but feel sorry for me. So, <laughs> have you ever been in a maybe a debate?
debate or an argument or a heated discussion over like a hot button topic of politics, religion, something like that, and you really want to try to find middle ground, who's a middle grounder? Who wants to find middle ground? Anybody? Yeah, I want to find middle ground all the time. And some of the people that I talk to, there's no such thing as middle ground. Yes, there is. There's middle ground. I mean, when you have two extremes, a pro and a con, you want to be able to meet in the middle. But here's the thing with middle ground. In order to meet in the middle, somebody has to give up something. Somebody has to take a loss. Somebody has to give up what they believe. Somebody has to compromise, right? That's what middle ground is. And for me, there is no compromising when it comes to the doctrine of Jesus Christ that we believe in. There is no, I am not going to have any middle ground when it comes to, was Jesus God incarnate? Amen. Jesus born of a virgin? Amen. Right? Jesus lived a life to show us what the invisible God, the characteristics of God is like, what the kingdom of heaven is like. Amen. Amen. Right? He died a death physically on a cross. I'm not compromising on that. He laid in a tomb, right? Amen. For three days and on the third day he rose bodily from the dead, ascended up to heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God. I am not going to compromise. So for me, there is no middle ground on that. There's no middle ground. So how do you have a conversation with someone that doesn't believe that? Because that's our job, isn't it? We're to go out and share the good news, and we're going to run into more and more people that don't believe. So what are we going to do? We're going to find common ground. Common ground is different than middle ground, right? Would you agree? Common ground is to look at the other person, not as an opponent. I'm going to tell you a story if this happened at the concert. I didn't want to because it's embarrassing, but I'm going to. Why am I always the bad guy? Anyway, I say don't learn. Anyway, common ground is you look at the other person, not as an opponent, because I don't know about you, but when I get into an argument, I want to win. Anybody else? So they are now an opponent, right? They, they are completely wrong and they are an opponent. But if we find common ground, what we're trying to do is to understand that the other person is not an opponent. The other person is a human being with a soul that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And if we are going to defend the faith, which is what we need to do, we have to find common ground. And I think maybe that's what Reverend Tim Keller had in mind when he wrote his book, The Reason for God. This is what he writes. I wrote the book because of the polarization over religion, meaning religion was getting more religious and less religious at the same time. This polarization was creating a loss for those in the middle, the nominal, nominally religious and the uncommitted. I came to feel a need for a third camp. A group of Christians who had a concern for justice in the world, but who grounded it in the nature of God rather than in their own subjective feelings. So we're beginning a new sermon series on this book, The Reason for God, Belief in the Age of Skepticism. Would you believe we're in the age of skepticism? Yep, you've seen it, you've heard it, you've talked to your co-workers, you know that they are either for Jesus and believe in him full-heartedly, or they are completely against him, right? And they don't want to hear, and they might say something nice like, you believe what you want to believe, but don't push your beliefs on me. But that's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to spread the gospel. We don't push our beliefs on each other, but kind of we have to, because God's going to hold us accountable. How did you talk to that atheist? How did you talk to that person who doesn't believe? What did you do? So we're going to talk about this for the next few weeks, and we're going to start with a topic or a statement, not a topic, a statement that unbelievers make against Christianity, and we're going to learn how to defend Christianity, okay? So this is what we're going to do. I know. Tell me if this is a train wreck. I'll try to do something different next time with the next statement, but anyway, so Reverend Timothy Keller, he passed away a year ago, two years ago. He was a founding pastor of the Redeemer Presbyterian Church in downtown New York City. So you can imagine he had all kinds of different people in his congregation, all kinds of different backgrounds, different cultures, economic status. Um, some were highly intelligent with, uh, intelligent with doctorates and PhDs. That's the same thing, isn't it? Anyway, a master's degree, and some of them were, you know, barely high school graduates or weren't high school graduates. So he had all these people coming to him with doubts, 
Some of them were doubters and they were skeptics, but some were ardent believers and they had frequent doubts and questions about religion. So what Tim did, Reverend Tim did, is he used literature, philosophy, and real life pastoral conversations to explain how the belief in a Christian God is in fact a sound and rational one. Now to us, it's very sound and rational to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, amen? This is why we're here worshiping. But out there, they don't believe it. And it can't be just a us camp against them camp because they're just going to get more and more polarized. They're going to get more and more. If they're an atheist, they're going to be, if they're an agnostic, they believe in a bigger power, they're going to eventually become an atheist because they're going to just be pushed that way. And the religious people are going to get more and more religious and just say, you know what, we're doing great. You know, we're good to go. We, we love Jesus and we're headed to heaven. You ever meet somebody like that? I don't need to share my faith. It's kind of a private thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. Why do you think Jesus went out and lived his life and, and talked to people everywhere he went and shared the good news? That's what he expects us to do. But it's hard work, folks, because we're going to run into people that do not believe and actually are out to prove that Christianity is not true. Okay? So, before we get started about our first skeptical statement made by unbelievers, we have to define the word apologetics. I know it's a big word, but this is what it means. It's the religious discipline of defending religious doctrines through systematic argumentation and discourse. Wow, that seems like something I don't want to do. That seems like homework. <laughs> but here's the thing. It was actually the word apologia comes from the ancient Greek legal system. So if you were a lawyer, you're going to study a lot of Greek in the Greek legal system because that's, that's where it came from. And so you would have a prosecutor that would um, deliver an accusation, and then you'd have a defendant, like in a court of law, you'd have a defendant that would deliver an apologia or a defense. Okay? So defending the Christian faith is called apologetics. Now, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can get into a debate with someone that's an unbeliever, and there's you, and you can go head-to-head -head looking at them as an enemy, and you are going to win. But the Apostle Peter tells us a different way to do it. The Apostle Peter writes to several congregations on how to defend their Christian faith. The Apostle Peter was living in a time where Christians were known as atheists. Did you know that? They were actually the atheists because the Romans would look at the Christian believers of the way of Jesus Christ. They'd say, you're atheists because you don't believe in our many pagan gods. So they were hated. We know that, we know that Nero was very cruel to Christians. And so some of these congregations said, well, all of them said, how do we defend our faith, Peter? So does Peter get up and does he say, you heard the scripture read, does he say, I'm going to write you a defense, an apologetic defense. It's going to be 25 pages long. It's going to be a thesis and you're just going to nail them. Or you're going to go out and you're going to have a debate and you're going to get in their face to prove them wrong. He says none of that. He says none of that. He says the first way you defend Christianity is to live as pilgrims on earth. Let's read it again. Dear friends or beloved, he says, I urge you, the believers in Christ, to live as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. It is going to be difficult to defend Christianity if we're not living Christianity. Now, what does he mean by being um, an exile? He means being a pilgrim, like you come, you're come, you on a pilgrimage, you're on a journey, you're a sojourner, you're just traveling through. We're on earth for what, 78 years maybe is the average age? We got a whole bunch of life to live in eternity, but we hold so tightly to this world. He says, live as a pilgrim, live as a sojourner, live as someone who holds loosely to this worldly values of material items and money and um, reputation and is my kid going to get into college so they can play track? That'll be great. But if they don't, that'll be great too. The kid's going to be okay if they know Jesus, right? So we're, we're traveling through this pilgrimage, learning about Jesus, spreading the love of Jesus. And I'll give you an example. It's like you're going on a trip. You're going across the country. You want to stop at all kinds of different states and you find this really great resort. And you love it. It's got pool, it's got slides for the kids, it's got four 
beautiful restaurants. You don't even have to go anywhere. You know, you just get up off your beach towel and off you go and get something to eat. You come back in and it's just amazing. Everybody's friendly and nice. So you're ready to go to the next state, but you love this resort so much. Do you call your realtor and say, sell my house, I'm moving into the hotel? Do you start hanging up pictures of your kids on the wall in the hotel room? Although the Marriott does have nice beds, I might add. But you know what I mean? Do you, do you do that? No, you stay, you enjoy it for the time, you do and experience it, and you move on to the next place. This is how it is as living as a pilgrim, as a believer of Jesus Christ. We're on a pilgrimage, we're on a spiritual journey, we are headed to eternity. We hold so tightly to the stock market, and then when it drops, what do you hear? Oh my gosh, I'm broke. You got food. You got a house. You got something to eat. I mean, I'm not happy when the stock market drops, but you know what? Am I starving? Oh, there's people that are starving. What I'm saying is we, we need to remember that this is not our home. This is truly not our home. Our home is in eternity. So Peter says, yeah, you can look at them as an opponent if you want, but you're not, you're not going to get very far because when they look at your life, they're going to say, you're hanging on to your stocks like it's everything. What if all the stock market just went away and we had no 401ks? Now, I'm not saying don't save. Please save. <laughs> but what if we did? Are we just going to give up? Oh, I might as well die now. We're all going to go, please, Jesus, come back. Right? <laughs> We're here for a short period of time, and Peter reminds us, if you want to defend the faith, you have to live as an example of that faith. He also reminds us that on this pilgrimage, we're all going to struggle with sin. So the common ground between us and an unbeliever is that we all struggle with sin. That unbeliever has just as much sin that they're struggling with as you do, but the difference is, is you have the Holy Spirit that's helping you. Helping you go, okay, I'm not going to lose my mind and strangle one of my relatives. <laughs> I'm going to pray for him, right? But the people that don't have Jesus, how do they control their sin? They don't. I mean, really, how many men have murdered their wives because they had, were having an affair and wanted their life insurance? Get a divorce! It's not complicated. <laughs> you can go online and get a divorce like that. You know, you know what I'm saying? But no, let's go out and murder. Why? What has gone on? People are losing. I mean, people are losing it, right? They really are. It's becoming more and more polarized. But I don't think Jesus is going to sit here and say, yeah, I understand the world's polarized. I see why you just picked your side and stayed around all your churchy people and, you know, it was safe there. I can see why you didn't go out and share the good news. Because somebody might disagree with you. They might actually hate you. They might persecute you. Every single disciple was martyred. We know that except for John. Every single disciple was murdered or martyred for their faith. I don't think we're going to get murdered, folks, but we can't even, you know, how are, how are we living? Are we living as pilgrims on a journey, struggling with sin just like the other person? So the second way Peter says to defend the faith is to maintain a lifestyle of doing good. But listen to this. Doing good, not to achieve salvation. Listen to what he says. Live... Christians, such good lives among the pagans, unbelievers, nominally, unnominally churched, you know, those people that, you know, haven't really committed yet, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So notice the first thing is that unchurched and unbelievers are watching our good deeds. They're also watching what we do at work. They're watching what we do at concerts. They're watching what we do um, as we live our lives. Okay? Now, Peter says, do good so that they can't hold it against you that you're doing something you're not supposed to be doing. Right? So I'll tell you the story. So we're at the concert, this big old church, and they got um, a security team there. And I'm with Tony, and um, she said I could tell the story. I'm with Tony Nye, who's blind and has a leader dog. And on the dog's harness it says don't touch me I'm working please don't touch me I'm working okay and if you've seen Tony you know she's blind right you look at her she's blind right she's got her dog so we're walking in and people are coming around us all over this big security guy says I need you to stop right there with the dog and, <laughs> and Tony are like okay because comments like the dog's like where am I going what am I doing 
And so I said, Tony said, what's wrong? And he goes, nothing's wrong. You just need to go over there and talk to the head of security. So I'm trying to get her through all these people. I mean, this is a, this holds what is New Hope, hold thousands of people. And I'm not bashing that church. You know, we got to have security people, and I understand that. So, so we go over to the um, head of security, and he says, hey, um, we're doing a new thing with dogs, and we need to see your uh, papers that this is a service dog to prove that this is a service dog. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I uh, know. Yeah. Hey, I was biting my tongue, wasn't I, ladies? So Tony is flustered. She's like digging through her purse, trying to find if she has any of her whatever the uh, American Disabilities Act, something or other, paperwork, whatever you need for this dog. And I'm still looking at him, and, and he was not very nice. <laughs> Just put that on top of the cherry on top. But I'm like, okay, whatever. So, you know, we're looking, and she goes, I've never had to do this before. And I said, are you sure you can even ask that question? You know, I was like, I'm sure of, you know, I'm of this. And so, you know, we're holding up the line and all of this. And it was just embarrassing for her. And so finally he says, well, if you can find it, come back. So we get back to the seat and I'm telling the other ladies about it. And one, she's so smart. She goes, well, you're already here. Why do you need to go back? I said, oh, we need to go back. <laughs> <laughs> and Tony goes, we're going back. <laughs> so she gets her dog we go back. But she found something in her in her purse that was red that said something about her name and her address and it just said um, American Disabilities Act something but didn't still didn't say this is a service dog so we go back and I say to the big guy can you give me the head of security again he goes sure here he is right here and so Tony hands this to him is this what you want he goes oh so you did have something didn't you now I'm annoyed <laughs> now I'm annoyed and I'm gonna stick up for her because I'm annoyed so I said you know I don't think you can ask this question and you know what? You've been staring at her in the face for the last however long since we walked in the door. And if you had some common sense, you'd know she's blind. <laughs> he goes, well, we're doing a new thing and we're, and Tony's like, I, I don't think you can do, which I understand. There's a lot of people that put service dog jackets on their dogs because it's a dog that they want to take into the nuts with them. And it's not a service dog. But if you see how a service dog acts compared to another dog that is just a dog, I mean, my dog will walk into Menards and poop on the floor. I mean, that's what he does. He's stupid, and then he's going to look for food. He's not a service dog. This is a service dog. And I said, I just want you to know that I don't think you can ask that question. Someone may, you know, maybe prosecute you for asking that question. I don't know. And so I said, I just want you to know that I don't. He goes, well, the pastor's right there if you want to talk to him. I said, no, I think we've made our point quite clear. Goodbye. <laughs> and she goes, boy, I've never seen you be professionally angry. Uh, you don't need the elevators, go up the stairs. It's obvious, it's common sense. So I kept my cool, but I was a little annoyed. So people were watching, but you know what? I figured, I'm sticking up for Tony. Tony wants to go and talk about it with this guy, so we did. But people are watching our reaction. They're watching what we're saying and what we're doing. And so we gotta remember that, that we have to live a lifestyle that where we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're acting the way we're supposed to be acting. You know, now we're going to make mistakes, then apologize. Move forward and apologize. The common ground that we find with unbelievers in this world is that we all face problems. We all face people that are trying to, you know, ruin our reputations. We have to understand that responding to and defending the faith has to be done in a kind, professional manner, but also not trying to become middle ground, but finding common ground. Okay, so now we are on to the first statement that skeptics make about Christianity, against Christianity. So we know we're going to defend the faith, apologetics. We're going to do it in a way that looks at the person as a human being, not as an opponent, even though I was looking at that guy really as an opponent, so I was kind of doing bad. But I was nice. Anyway, kind of nice. I don't know, maybe I wasn't. Um, as Tony. So, but what I'm saying is we're looking at other person as a human being. Right? I guess I didn't expect it at a church, you know what I mean? But okay, there's whatever. So we have to look at them as a human being. We have to listen to what they're saying. We have to hear what they're saying. We have to live as though we're moving on to eternity, even if we don't 
convince them of Jesus Christ. We're still moving on. We're doing our job. Like Jesus said, if they don't listen, dust your feet and move on to the next city, right? So that brings us to the statement. The first one is there can't just be one religion. Have you heard this out there? There can't just be one right religion. Okay? There's all kinds of major religions, and your way cannot be the only way. Christianity cannot be the only way. Now, in order to defend the faith, this is what we're going to do. We're going to look at the meaning behind that statement. Why are they asking that statement? Why are they making that statement? Why are they, why are they so certain that there is no one way to know God and to be saved? And why isn't it Christianity? We've got to know why they're asking that question. The next thing we have to look at is we have to use some common sense. God gave us a brain, right? He gave us a mind. Let's use some common sense. And then the third way we defend the faith is that we use reason, all while maintaining that common ground. Okay, so if you're like me, a type A personality that really gets, well, I wanted to defend her, gets really, you know, type A-ish, you got to calm down. You know what I mean? You got to you got to put it in perspective. You got to get it in check. And if you can't get it in check, go practice with that person that irritates you, and try to hold it in check. Because you're not going to get anywhere if all you do is scream and yell at people, right? You're just going to push them further and further away. That's what polarization is, pushing people further and further away to be atheists. If we really love people like God loves people, we're going to want them to know Jesus. We're going to want them to know, yes, there is only one, one religion that is correct. So the first way we defend this statement of one religion is we look at the personal meaning behind it. So when skeptics criticize Christianity for their exclusive truth claim, so our exclusive truth claim is that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation. Jesus Christ is the only way to know God, the creator, and to be saved, right? That Jesus is the only way. He says, I am the way, the truth, the life. This is what we believe, correct? Okay, if we don't work, then we've got another thing to talk about. But, so that's an exclusive truth claim, okay? So what they're saying is that when they say there can't just be one way, your way can't just be the only way, they are trying to stick up or defend the rights of the other religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, um, Islam, and Judaism. So they think they're standing up for them. You can't be the only way, Jesus can't be the only way to salvation because the Muslims are peace-loving people that believe in God too. Okay? If you were to ask a Muslim, do you believe that Jesus is God incarnate and the only way to heaven? They're going to say no. They're going to say no. And then they're going to say, see? See, we told you. But then the Muslims are going to say, no, my way is the only way to know God, the one true God. Going through Muhammad and doing all that, reading the Quran, my way is the right way. Then you ask the Buddhist, no. My way is the right way to get to nirvana. And you ask a Jewish person, following the law is the way to get to God, right? So, not all of us can be right. <laughs> not all of us can be right. So, a person trying to say that Christianity and its exclusive truth claim can't be the only religion is not defending the other religions because they have their own exclusive truth claim. Do you get it? So that brings us to number two. How do we defend that there is only one religion, one faith in Christ that gets you to salvation? is common sense. Let's use some common sense. They all have a truth claim. Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, um, Judaism, Christianity, okay? We all have our own exclusive truth claim, and not all of us can be correct. Not all religions can be correct if they all differ. I mean, that's just common sense, isn't it? That's using your brain. That's like, you can't tell that she's blind? That's just common sense. It's common sense that a Christian and a Muslim who have totally different ways of salvation can both be correct. There can't just be one religion. Well, we can't all be right. So somebody's got to be wrong and somebody's got to be right. So let's use some common sense, some common sense. So our defense would be when you say that there cannot be one religion, so what they do is they'll say, they'll say that um, all religions basically teach the same thing, not exactly the same thing, but they only see part of the spiritual reality. They can only see part of it. 
So that's what they're meaning when they say there can't be just one religion. You can't be right because you see this through Christ, but they see this through Muhammad, and they see this through, you know, whatever. Our defense would be, how would you know that? How would you person saying that you, there cannot be just one right way to get to God through Jesus Christ, the only way you would know that is if you have superior knowledge of all of the spiritual truth. And they don't. Now that's a lot, isn't it? But that's one of the very common things that unbelievers will say to us. You guys are exclusive. I don't like it. You're harming others. Look at the look at the history of Christianity. You know, there's been wars waged. There's been wars waged over all religions. But we're not going to say, we're not going to spit that out. We're going to wait and listen to them and say, well, how can you say that there's not one right religion unless you absolutely know everything about spiritual truth? And they're going to go, well, how, that's our defense. That's our defense. So the last way that we defend that there's one religion, one way through Jesus Christ is to use reason. So would you agree that all human beings has asked the same question, what is the meaning of life? It's been going on since the beginning of time. All the philosophers, all the literature, everything you read at school in English, all of that, English class, everyone asks, what's the meaning of life? Why am I here? Why was I made? You know, what's the purpose of life? What am I supposed to be doing? Okay, so all of us have that question. An atheist has that question. An agnostic, an agnostic is someone who believes in higher power but doesn't believe that Jesus is God. Okay, so they're kind of like uncommitted. They're kind of just hanging out there. They like a little bit of all the different religions, like they're a la carte, right? You have a staunch atheist who's like, there's nothing, we're dirt, and to, you know, we're just dirt. We're gonna go back in the ground and worm's gonna eat us up and that's gonna be it. Have a nice day. And then you have people that believe in religion, whichever religion it is, and we believe in Jesus. So we use reason. If everyone, every human being has the same question, what is the meaning of life? They really have a religious system. Because religion is what? Religion is a set of beliefs that explains what life is all about. We have a religious system called Christianity. And we live for Jesus. And we do what Jesus told us to do. And we don't hold tightly onto our material items. We know we're only passing through. We know that we have a longer life in eternity than we do here on earth. So we live this set of values or this set of beliefs explaining who we are and what's the most important thing we should be doing on earth. That's, just, that's what religion is. That's what that word is. For some people, like atheists, they believe that it's a material world. That's all there is. We're here by accident or by chance. When we die, we rot. Therefore, it's important to choose to do whatever makes you happy and not let anyone else impose their beliefs on you. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're just dirt, and to dirt we're going back. <laughs> However, although this way of defining the meaning of life is not an organized religion, it is also known as a secular moral religion. So in itself, it is a set of beliefs. To believe that there's, that there's just the material world it just came to be. You and I just, you know, we're, we weren't created. We were made, you know, the way babies are made. We live a life. We die. We go back to the dirt. There's no afterlife. This is what they're saying. That in itself takes faith to believe that. That is a set of beliefs that they live their life by. So how can they say how can they say that we can't live by a set of beliefs and religion is bad when they have their own moral secular religion? Because to believe that takes just as much faith to believe that God created the world and created every human being with the need to worship him. So, using reason of all religions, even secular moral religion, try to define the meaning of life, who's right? Who's right? Maybe the question should be this. Which religion or fundamental set of beliefs lead their believers to do the most loving and be more receptive to those who differ from them? 
Is it going to be Buddhist? No. Islam? No. Islam, you're lucky if you're, you know, you're the, what, 100,000 that are going to be hanging out with the virgins. The rest of us are just going to be working. That sounds like something I'd like to join, right? Or the Jewish people that are still waiting for Messiah. Who's right? The question should be, which religion leads people to do good? Which religion is full of grace? Which religion leads believers to love others even though they don't like them? There's only one that does that, and that's Christianity. That is Christianity. Every other major religion has to work for salvation. The Muslims do. The Jewish people have to follow the law. That's working, folks. The Buddhists have to do something. I don't even know what it is. The Hindus have to follow this skirt, whatever it is. If you look into these major religions, they all have to attain salvation. We do not. Salvation is in Christ alone. We do not have to work for it. It is a free gift given to us because of the love of God. And so then we take that love and we share it with the world. We're the only ones, we're the only religion that has its people go out and do good. Do I? Do we send you out of the church to say, hey, go, you know, smack somebody else the head? No. We say, take what you're learning, take the light, and be the light of the world. That's the way we defend the faith. We say, yes, there can be, and there is one religion and there is one exclusive way to know God and to and to have salvation and that is through Jesus Christ alone that's why Peter makes his exclusive truth claim there is salvation in no one else he says God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved so there's your first I told you it's gonna be hard I don't know what to tell you it's gonna be hard it's not easy to talk about it. Most of us, when someone says, oh, pff, I don't like the fact that you Christians are all, you know, it's Jesus' way or no way. And so what do we say? Well, of course it is. We've already shut them off, and they're already on their way to their atheist group. We have to learn to find the common ground. We have to learn to stand up for what we believe. We're not giving up anything that we believe. So when they say, well, you know, you know, eventually they'll know who God is. They all know who God is. We're all worshiping the same God just in different ways. <coughs> no, God is Jesus incarnate. It's got to be that way. It is that way. We're the only ones that send people out to do good. Not to gain salvation. Because that comes through grace. But to be the light for others. So that's our first one. I hope that... You know what, if it was a train wreck, it is, but I'm not a very good apologist. But that's what we got to know. That's what we got to talk about. If we don't, we're going to be held accountable for it. Jesus isn't going to say, well, that pastor, she just did an okay job on that sermon. Go get the book, The Reason for God. Read the book. A lot of you have bigger brains than I do. Figure out how to do it. Because he's going to say, what are you doing? Well, I'm trying to be nice. You're trying to do it in your own strength. How are you going to talk to someone about Jesus being the only way without turning them off? That's what we got to do. So we'll have another question next week, and we'll see how long this goes. I mean, dump out of it because it's hard. But, um, you know, keep praying for me because, you know, I don't know what to tell you. It's just apologetics is hard, especially if you do it trying to find common ground. Everybody can scream and yell and pol polarize each other. That's easy work. But, but trying to find common ground is hard. So um, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning, and thank you for reminding us that our job is to go out and to spread the gospel and not to live more um, with just churchy people. We're supposed to be out looking at others who don't know you, who don't believe in you, who are totally against you, and seeing that eventually their soul will be lost. They are lost, and our job is to come alongside them and show them and, and tell them why. There's only one way to know you, and that's through your son, Christ. So help us to do it. In the name of Christ, amen. All right, so we have five minutes. So we're going to do prayers right now, so you can lift up a hand and just uh, say a name and health or surgery. Yeah. Again, my sister Deanna, hopefully results this week.
Deanna for results. Okay, thank you. Um, Verdana for health. She's still in the hospital. Yeah, and her roommate, Dee, needs the answers for all her health. And she's got a roommate named Dee in the hospital, so we want to put Dee down. She's got some health issues a lot. Obviously, she's in the hospital. She needs some answers as well. Yeah, Dan. For Israel. Thank you. Yeah, Joyce Jim. For health. Joyce for health. Ellie was 16. She's a 16. Sweet 16. Yay. Happy birthday, Ellie. And it's the birthday party that never ends, so she's got more stuff to do. It's been going on since last weekend. I love it. Stacy. Um, for our family, for Beaverton, that lost um, their dad and husband, the younger family, the Lawler family, L-O-A-R. L-O-A-R. Lost their father. Okay. So I'm going to pray for them. How about for some of these guys? How about for our vets? Our veterans, thank you. Our military, thank you. Yep. Ellie. For our Aunt Norma, who's home in the hospital, but it's not good. Mm. So for Norma, who's not doing well. She's up there in, oh no, she's, I don't know. They're in Florida. They're in Florida. Okay, so for Norma, thank you. Carolyn for surgery and Ann for health. Ann for health and Carolyn for surgery. Michelle for Ann and grandson Isaiah for health. Okay, so Isaiah for health and for Michelle for a scan, for good results. Other prayers? Steve. My friend Matt for health and personal. Matt for health and personal, thank you. For those who have lost loved ones, they're still grieving. We know that that never goes away. So we just pray for them as they work through their grief. Diane. Uh, pray for our youth all the way from little to Yep, our youth. We gotta. Re we really gotta train them up to know these stories, so that they can go and be defend little defenders of the faith. Others. All right. Unbelievers. Unbelievers. Thank you. All right. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that the Holy Spirit is the one that helps us speak when we need to, to find common ground, to. Be passionate about you, Lord, and passionate about the gospel enough to go out and when we have a conversation, to find that common ground and then to calmly, kindly, lovingly look at the other as a person that is created by you that needs to hear the gospel and to do whatever we need to do, Lord, to be able to defend the faith. Because it's got to be Jesus. It's got to be you, Jesus. It's got to be, it's got to be you all about you. And so, Lord, help us to do that. For the prayers of your people, there are many that have tests coming up, a lot of CAT scans. Um, we are praying for some uh, results, some answers, good news, no cancer. If it is cancer, that it's not very far along and can be treated. We pray for those that have been sent home from the hospital that there's nothing else that they can do for them. But we know, Lord, that you can. And we'll pray for a miracle, Lord. We pray for a cure for cancer. Those that are on hospice, those that are having surgery, Lord, we thank you for the medical advances, and we just thank you for how good you are to us. Pray for our military, those out that are keeping us safe, for our veterans. Lord, we thank them for all they've done for us. Lord, we thank you for teaching us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, I'm going to, while the praise team's coming up for the song, I'll go ahead and pass the plates. We also have, in the back, Vacation Bible School is our um, grateful giving basket. So if somebody wants to grab that basket on uh, the way up or bring the plates up. All right, please stand and join us.
inside them to go out and to share the good news that you, yes, Jesus, are the only way to know you, Father, as Father. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Invite your friends, the community, because you can only see it through a church right now. So the first four episodes we have, and I think they've dropped the other ones, so that we might just continue on. Uh, there's a children's ministry meeting and a youth ministry meeting, so if you're interested in getting involved in that, um, please join us after you grab something to eat. Where are we meeting, Maggie? Uh, Depends on how many people, maybe in the little conference room. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the nursery if it's a tiny. If not, we can do it up here. Okay, so the nursery or up here. All right, so let's pray. Do you have anything else? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word, for knowing you, and for loving us. Thank you that your gift of salvation is free. The only ones, only ones who receive salvation as a gift from you and what you've done for us. So let us go out and share that. In the name of Christ, amen. amen.